It's a pleasure to be here. Big fan Good of the show. Eric. Yeah, thanks. It's been months since we first made the pitch, but this is finally all together. I'm now working with you at On Deck. Sagar's coming in with the podcast here, so that's the way things work here. But look, you've got a really interesting background. You're a venture capitalist. You're the founder of On Deck, which we'll get into a bit later. And before that, you were an early stage employee at tech companies. So the first thing anyone from the audience is going to want to hear from you is what are your thoughts from the tech industry's perspective on what happened last week? Obviously, we're not looking to have you get into the politics of it. We don't want you to play. I don't even know how to say it. We don't need you to get into Jack Dorsey's head, but let's talk about the deeper structure of what's going on here because something fascinating that's been happening on Twitter that a lot of our listeners probably haven't seen is there's this big debate by people like Balaji, Srinivasan who's come on the show, Naval Ravikant, talking about how from now on, tech is going to decentralize because of what happened. We're going to see different countries come up with their own versions of Twitter. Individual users are going to create their own servers to host their own social media platforms. It's all sort of confusing. So what do you think about all of this? It's interesting. The, you know, there was this response to, to Twitter and Facebook banning accounts, which was, it's not censorship. You could just create your own app. And, and then there was this response to Google and Apple banning apps, which was, it's not, your, it's not censorship. Just create your own operating system. <laughs> and then Amazon bans web hosting. And people are like, it's not censorship. Create your own, you know, what? Your own internet just so you can send a tweet as, as, as a tweet version of that argument go, going around. And it's just funny how, how sort of the goalposts keep shifting. And, and to, to zoom out here a little bit, the, the, the first era of the internet was an incredibly idealistic time. Everything was going to be more democratic because we started with open protocols. But what happened in the 2000s was companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook built products that outpaced the capabilities of open protocols and everything became centralized again. And it was decentralized prior. The good news, and the reason why we didn't you know, care too much, was that billions of people got access to amazing technologies, a lot of them for free. The bad news is that Fang or GAFA became our new overlords. Hmm. So that's Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, all yes. those sort of people. Yeah, you, you couldn't really leave Facebook and Twitter and, and start your own new one because they controlled all of our data. You couldn't just you know, transport your, your friends list or your follower graph. And, and if you did start a new app like Parler, you know, AWS might, might ban you. Um, and so, so fast forward a few years, you know, 2016, and, and, a, and a decentralized crypto movement emerges. You know, Bitcoin started before that, but we were talking about a, a decentralized internet. And the ethos of a crypto movement was that governments and corporations were, were too powerful. We're getting too centralized. And we needed to change from don't be evil, which was Google's motto of, of their ethics, to, to can't be evil, to literally don't have the power to you know, take down people because of their because of their views, and and in the crypto movement, people first focused on the money use case because you saw uh, countries like Venezuela and others that were just inflating their currency, and so Bitcoin as a store of value solved a real problem. It, it served a real use case. The decentral the decentralized internet was still kind of hypothetical because as many complaints as there have been about censorship, it's it, it hasn't been a huge issue. And centralized services just work way better. And so the only reason why you switch to decentralization is if you were solving for the censorship use case. And that wasn't existential. But what we saw in the past week was coordinated efforts across every level of the stack uh, to ban not just a person, but an entire app. So, uh, so now the stakes of creating decentralized internet at every level of the stack ha have never been higher. And, and I'm starting to see a lot more focus in, in my groups of people from people who want to build decentralized uh, you know, uh, layers of the internet, uh, starting with social media. And, and I'm more excited about this bottoms up approach than a tops down approach uh, you know, from, uh, uh, with, via regulation, because you know, our political system doesn't really have the political will nor the technical competence to regulate effectively. And what happens with, or with a concern is that you might regulate in a way that makes incumbents actually stronger. And what we've seen in the past is that the bottoms up approach has typically been better. Microsoft disrupted IBM, the next wave of tech giants disrupted Microsoft, and hopefully decentralized companies will disrupt Google and Facebook. What I love about what you're saying, Eric, is that there's still an optimistic free market case of what you're making, because currently the discourse within the American political right is it's over, just go build your own is like basically a meme, and to the extent it is, but you're actually talking about 
building something new that is tech is technically possible, like technologically possible in terms of decentralization. The question I have for you is, is decentralization the only way forward? Because we're also seeing these emergence of paid, I want to, I don't want to call them walled communities, but like semi walled communities and like curated communities where people are having conversation and, and basically entrance of social, which is like this interesting fusion of the old, all open social media, and then also not fully decentralized. Is that what the future looks like? So from your perspective, somebody actually involved in this industry, maybe even funding the next competitor, building the next competitor, give us some sense of the trajectory of the different ways they could look. It could look fully decentralized, it could look somewhere in the middle, or is there even a free market answer to Twitter or Facebook, et cetera? I think there's a free market answer. Uh, I, I think it's gonna take a while. It's not tomorrow, it's not next year. Uh, it might not even be two years from now. It, 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 it's going to take a while. Um, you know, there was this uh, tweet from my friend Connor, who runs uh, Rome, uh, which is a great note-taking app, where he said that the, the scariest words in the Eng English language were "bology was right," <laughs> <laughs> and he was right about COVID when everyone was going yeah. crazy. And he's been talking about the need to decentralize for a long time, and, and he, he was right about that. I, I think we're going to see a hybrid approach. I, I think in the interim. Um, you know, I'm very pessimistic as it relates to this idea of, are we going to have unity? I think basically the internet is going to bifurcate. We're going to have a blue internet and we're going to have a red internet. And the problem is that the internet right now is so blue that uh, if the red internet starts to get off the ground and it gets on the ground, off the ground in an unsavory way, the, the blue internet is going to block it. Um, so I think we're going to see parallel, basically like a right wing version or conservative version of, uh, of, of you know, nearly every blue company. Um, and I think some of those are going to get off the ground, be really powerful. I think some of those might get banned. Um, and thus, you need the decentralized uh, version uh, in, or, in order to that, that to happen. So I, th I think we're going to see a hybrid. I think the sort of, um, you know, centralized approach, but just sort of, uh, you know, a right wing version or or a, you know, they, they wouldn't call it that, that perhaps, but just a different version will, will, will exist. Uh, but medium to long term, um, you know, we're going to have to move uh, decentralized if you want to remove, you know, all choke points uh, in, in the system. Because if 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 we're seeing what we saw with Parler extend to other uh, apps, and they're changing their rules on the fly, that's what's most concerning about this. Is, is there's no like set constitution that they have to, uh, you know, abide by as as a private company, um, you know, outside of what, what our actual constitution allows them to do, and and they're just sort of you know responding to sentiment um, and and pressure within their own companies. Can I and bring? So Oh, sorry. I just want to bring a degree of optimism into the conversation sure. because Please. we did want to have you on for optimistic yes. reasons. Please. I don't agree with the red state or red Twitter, blue Twitter take in the long term. In the short term, there's definitely a lot of money for anyone who's libertarian and to the right of that trying to say Twitter is horrible. It's bad. I'm going to create the operationally right version of that that will have different degrees of moderation slash censorship, depending on your perspective on that topic. That's going to have different approaches to what's the terms of service, all those bigger things. But that being said, when you're thinking as a venture capitalist, Eric, if I were pitching you this service, I think the key question you'd be answering is, what's the problem that any user of the incumbent service is actually trying to solve? And let's be frank for a second. 99.999% of conservatives on Twitter and on Facebook are having a totally fun time. The funniest cases that I see, and this is definitely happening within my own family, not to call anyone out too hard, but I have a relative who has sub 300 followers on Twitter who just quit the app because they're afraid that, quote, Jack is going to come for them. <laughs> I can guarantee very few things, but Jack Dorsey is not coming for post 60 year old boomer with 300 followers who are mostly anon accounts, right? So from my perspective, it doesn't seem like post the next six months, because the next six months are going to be full of all forms of overreach, all this craziness and every level of our policy. But I just don't see a world in July 2021 where Twitter is still not usable enough to the point where there isn't going to be that big of an big of an opportunity for people. So how do you think about that as a venture capitalist? Well, there, there's there's this interesting um, there's this thing called you know Robert Conquest's law, the, the second law, which, which states that if you're not if, if a company or organization isn't explicitly right, it ends up being left. Um, mm -hmm. And and the the inverse of that is if a company is not explicitly left, 
it ends up being labeled as right. And so I think we're seeing this with Substack, right? I mean, the, the joke this past week was like, is Donald Trump going to get a Substack now? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be incredible. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, you know, if, if a company doesn't go to where the furthest people want it to go, it's going to be labeled uh, as, as, as right. And I think we're going to see a lot of companies that, you know, they want, they're classical liberal, like they, they, they don't want to be right, but they're going to be classified um, as right if they don't go uh, go all the way. I, I think as a venture capitalist, I mean, going back to, to Sagar's point a little bit, I think private communities are are going to be, um, you know, enormous. And, and that's what OnDeck is, and we'll get to it in, in, in a bit. But I think people are, um, you know, kind of, I mean, even before all, all of this, we're retreating from, uh, from, from the public sphere a bit. You know, people joke that um, Twitter is a, is a library inside of a civil war. Uh, like our, our, our public platforms have just gotten too, too chaotic and people have been searching for, for people who think like that, for people who, um, who they can resonate with and not have to deal with, you know, not be called, you know, all, all these sorts of names by, by the other side. So I'm very excited about the, uh, you know, the emergence of, of private paid communities that are unbundling a certain, you know, certain audience or a certain interest group that is underserved by our public uh, platforms and, uh, and, and, and looking to invest in them. This is what I'm really fascinated by. And I actually heard you say this elsewhere. And I want to tease it out here is about what we have lost from public communication. Um, and w what we have lost from people thinking out loud, so to speak, as in it's extraordinarily valuable, actually, to hear people think out loud and say controversial opinions and have it all spill out into the public discourse. And somebody else jumps in and says, well, have you thought about this? And this is something which very much typified Twitter, I would say, like five or six years ago when I started getting like really into the platform. Now, as it's been mass adoption or has begun more of a civil war, as you so to speak, in the political moment, it's frankly become a lot more anodyne. And the most interesting conversations that I have on a daily day basis are in like private group chats. And I, this is what I heard you talk about, which is like we're gleaning so much information from our friends which in a, used to be at least in a semi-public or public environment completely, which is now just retreated. What do you think that's cost as a society? I don't even want to, I don't want to make it a generic cancel culture oh. take, but you're like, look, like toxicity and caustic discourse has made it so that people don't want to think out loud. And that's a problem. And I think we should talk about it more. The saddest part is we'll never know what we're losing. Um, you know, it, it, it's impossible to, to quantify, you know, um, uh, Mark Andreessen, for example, is somebody who who used to tweet all the time and share all, all these interesting insights and, and so many people learn from them. And then he he totally retreated. Uh, he he you know, is 100 percent off Twitter, you know, has the same conversations, but in private. But so many more people would be learning if, if we're in public. But just the the cost doesn't make sense for him anymore. And there are hundreds of people for whom that is the case. So our, the, the amount that people could learn, could be inspired, could, could build on top of each other is, 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 is just so much. And, when, when, and, and we can't calculate it. When Stephen Johnson in his book, Where Good Ideas Come From, I mean, the TLDR of that book is it comes from a marketplace of ideas. It comes from a very dense uh, you know, group of uh, you know, people who are sharing ideas, building on top of their ideas, building on top of hunches is, is the words uh, he, he used. And um, it, it's really sad. I mean, it, it, it's really sad uh, that basically what we see in the last 60 years is the group that has the power now, now want, it, is censoring the group that doesn't. And, and that is flipped. You know, it, was, it was the right that used to have all, a, a lot of the cultural power and, and they were censoring uh, a, a lot. And, and now, and now it's, it's, it's the opposite in, 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 certain, in certain circles. And I, I even saw Noam Chomsky, who I believe has you know, supported you know, extreme communist revolutions. I just say this to say he's so far left wing. Even he is saying, hey, we shouldn't be censoring. You know, free speech yeah. is our, is our device. Like we, the left, have been the advocates of, of free speech for for so long. And uh, I, I saw a great tweet that, that said, "If uh, if Noam Chomsky is telling you to ease up on your your censorship, that's like um, you know Snoop Dogg telling somebody to ease up on the on the weed, or you know, ease up on your leftism. It's like Snoop Dogg telling you to ease up on, on smoking weed." <laughs> so, so the last thing here that I want to get at is, what is the line between censorship? and moderation, right? So once again, we'll bring it to On Deck for a second. On Deck is communities of people that are working in different verticals. So for example, people who are interested in climate tech, people who are interested in podcasting, where I work, people who are writers, founders, et cetera. However, on the Slack channel of the group, if someone started cursing, 
bringing in bad vibes, not even breaking the law, right? So because people always make the exception of, no, look, if you like threaten violence, obviously you'll get kicked from something that's not censorship. But there's just such thing as bad vibes. There could be a world where I could be on the On Deck Founders Fellowship Slack and you, frankly, as a moderator who's curating a community – have to remove me because I'm just bringing the wrong perspective, not even perspective, just the wrong vibe into it. So how is someone who's organizing communities of people, how do you advise thinking that? Because the parlor situation is complicated. Sagar and I will do a more dedicated episode about it. But the one thing that I do think happened here is parlor did not think hard enough about this question of what is the difference between censorship about people's views, which are not inherently harmful, and just the idea that you don't want to have a toxic dumpster fire that no one wants to hang out in. I know plenty of right-wing friends, some of the most right-wing people I know, who said, oh yeah, I left Parler because it was a dumpster fire. So how can people who are building communities along these private, smaller degrees think about that? I think you want to plan as much as possible, or be explicit as much as possible in your code of conduct of, of what you will take uh, and, and what, what you will not take, and you want to screen uh, early on for it. So if you you say, hey, you know, we're we're going to invite speakers, and we're not going to, um, you know, uh, can- cancel them. Uh, we're not going to disinvite them um, for for X Y Z reason. You should say that to your community members when you're interviewing them. And if if they you know are on board with that, they, they you know maybe even have them do a pledge or something, then you have an explicit agreement. I, I think what's challenging, and you can't plan for everything, but is when you you don't plan for stuff. And you, you know, have misaligned expectations and now you're at the whim of, of your users. So I try to be as explicit as possible early on so, th- so that you prepare for it. A good example here is, is Substack. They, they released a, a post uh, a few weeks ago where they basically said, hey, we're going to have a, and I like this approach too, we're going to have a federalist approach. Um, we're going to uh, enable uh, writers, uh, you know, the many communities that we have to, to set their own rules. We're not going to set, you know, from, 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 the, from, from the top. Um, and they did this preemptively because they know that you know something is going to come up, and they can now point to, to their rules as opposed to where where Twitter and some of these other places are, which is they're making up rules on the spot, and that that's when you really lose trust. Mm-hmm. Totally. So, last thing before we get to present day, I love this story. Your previous first company for Product Hunt before um, Village Global was wrapped. Uh, it was and correct me if I'm wrong, like Chat Roulette. Ask beatboxing, um, not beatboxing, like rap, rap, like rap that, battles and everything. Like, beatbo- that'd be the lamest beatboxing. It's not, <laughs> that'd be the lamest company ever. But what was so interesting is obviously, like, no offense, it, you know, this it didn't yeah. quite work out. But what's crazy is when I heard you talking about it on a recent podcast appearance, you think about this and you're like, wait a second. Before TikTok became an actual company, it was Musically, which was, frankly, I think a lamer idea than Rap Battles, which was not that Rap Battles are lame, but a lame lame idea from my perspective is lip syncing. And it obviously didn't work out, but once you took that platform and attached TikTok's algorithm to it, (laughs) it became the biggest thing ever, separate from the geopolitical debate there. So how, as you look at that space, do you just think about that experience? And that's a combination of you enter a market too early. The world obviously wasn't there in 2012. There was no magical algorithm to fix those issues. How do you just think about that space? There's there's a few things there. So, So Mark Andreessen has this line where he says, there are no dumb ideas, only ideas that are too early. Um, and of course, there are some ideas, uh, dumb, dumb ideas, but the ideas that people ridiculed in the um, internet bubble uh, in 99 or, or early 2000s, uh, you know, pets.com, uh, Webvan, uh, there, there were a few others. That, home grocer. You know, I was a home grocer yeah. house. That was my thing. Exactly. These were massive failures. Today, they're all unicorns. Uh, so, so similarly, you know, Rapt.fm didn't work out, but interactive social video, we were all also experimenting with sort of patronage uh, models at the time. It, it, it was just too early. Um, and it, 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 was, it, it was earlier than Twitch uh, even, um, but then of course, uh, the, you know, Musical.ly and, and, and TikTok. Um, and in terms of, you know, how to think about when you might be too early, I, I think, you know, these are hard to predict, but it, it, my line here is if you're younger in, in your career and you're starting a company, you want to take more market risk than, than execution risk. When, when you're older and you're more experienced and you know how to build company, you know how to build teams and you can raise a lot of money, you, you want to take execution risk, i.e. do something that, uh, you know, if, if you execute, you know will work. But when you're younger or when you're less experienced and don't really have unfair advantages, you want to be have the arbitrage of willing to do things that other people think are dumb or think are too early or think are not ready yet. 
And sometimes that gets you into this, hey, you're building VR and it's way too early and it's been too early for 30 years now. <laughs> but sometimes you're you're built, you know, you get into Bitcoin or you get into crypto, you start Coinbase and and you're multi-billionaires. So, uh, so th that's some of my advice there. Yeah, I think that's amazing. I mean, I guess this gets to what we're what you're doing right now because I'm fascinated by the backstory of this company. I heard you talk about it previously, which is on deck. And you were saying you're like, if you this is not the way that you're supposed to start a company. Um, and fitting with our realignment thesis, just go, you know, like tease tease that out a little bit, which is that look, a lot of our listeners may not even have any any, you know, experience starting a company. Many of them don't are just look outside looking in on venture capital. What is the traditional way that you're supposed to start a business? Then talk to us about how you started that business within this funding model and like why it's exciting, where it's taking us, and what that actually means in terms of a disruption in terms of how companies themselves get formed. A, a big realignment that happened in, in how startups get off the ground is that it used to be the case where before AWS and before all these tools, it was really hard to, to, to build the technology. Um, it was mm -hmm. really hard. You needed to raise money in order to even see if something would work. Um, and so the the biggest question you know investors would ask is could this be built? Um, and and really important people to build the company were technical people. And, and Paul Graham had this arbitrage opportunity in in 2005 where he identified that he could teach young technical people um, how to do business um, and that they could build enormous companies. And he was right. Uh, and and it's led to you know right. Dropbox, Stripe, Airbnb, Airbnb, yeah, Airbnb. Airbnb. Yeah, massive companies, all, <laughs> yeah. all, all these amazing companies. Right. And so what, what's changed over, over the past decade or so is that the cost of getting a company off the ground um, decreased rapidly. And so everyone could ship a minimum viable product or, 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 or a beta or, or, or an early version of it uh, for free or, 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 or on their, without raising money. And so now the question became not can they build it, but will people come? Will users come? Can they hire a team? And so what happened was that the arbitrage was no longer the, the tech co-founder to teach them how to do business, but it actually flipped into uh, now it's the business founder uh, or the person who understands a deep domain, I should say, uh, mm -hmm. you know, insurance, healthcare, because software ate, ate the world, uh, you know, software, Mark Andreessen's famous line, it ate a lot of the things that um, everyone uses, you know, social networks, uh, search engines, uh, it, it's sort of like a lot of our public infrastructure. And now it's eating all these different domains. It's eating, uh, you know, fintech. It's eating healthcare. It's eating real estate, education. A lot of these like highly regulated um, spaces that require a lot of expertise. And so now the archetype of, and this relates to Dondek, the archetype of a founder is somebody who has that domain expertise. That's the scarcity now, and can build, you know, we, we, via no code and other other tools, can get something off the ground. Um, and where that relates to OnDeck is because OnDeck basically started out as a as something of a founder school. It, it started as a community for people. It was sort of like a think of a Y Combinator before people had companies. And so we would take a lot of these people who always wanted to start a company, or always, but never you know knew exactly how or never thought that they could because they weren't technical. And we either a pair them with technical people or b um, uh, you know help them get the tools that they need to get a, get an early version off the ground. But to your, and to your specific question of, of how we got the company off the ground, uh, it was a side project. Um, and, and because you can get things off the ground cheaper, you also don't necessarily need to be full-time on them uh, to make it work. It, it was a side project. Uh, I, I wasn't full-time on it for, for a couple of years. It emerged out of, out of a community, an organic community. Um, and we're, we're seeing that a, a, a lot more now where, where people, your product hunt also emerged out of, out of a side project that started to get momentum. And then when it did, uh, tri triple down on it, but that, yeah, that would have been, uh, inconceivable, uh, in the past. Hmm. A quick side note that I want to hit, because I love the example of the early, the late 1990s period where the infrastructure wasn't built because it brings up the famous British railways example, which I'm pretty sure you probably know, Eric, which is people look at the dot-com bust in 2000 and say, wow, pets.com. There's actually five different pets websites. So there was a real <laughs> genuine example of a bubble there, but you had Expedia, all these companies that just weren't ready for prime time. Everyone IPO too early, it didn't work, et cetera. And you could just look at that detail and say, wow, what a terrible failure. All these resources were misallocated. We don't like venture capital. But what ended up happening is all of the services 
and all the companies that were actually supported during that period, it effectively built the modern infrastructure that the next wave of tech was supported on. So the reason why Google was able to build the way it built, the reason why Facebook is able to build the way it built, the reason why the cost of running a server was able to collapse was the infrastructure was still there. And the example historically that people bring up is during the 1840s in the United Kingdom, there was this railway boom where everyone was obsessed with over-investing in railway, huge bubble, it burst, it's a total disaster if you got in on the railway stocks. But at the same time, afterwards, the British had an amazing railway system, which helped fuel the Industrial Revolution. So as you look at those historical examples, how do you think about, because once again, this is something we're interested in the realignment, how do you think about the interplay of history and business and politics? Because the more you dive into this stuff, the more you realize it's really tied together. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's interesting because in, in 2016, 2017, uh, we had this ICO boom where all these crypto projects- What's an ICO? Uh, initial coin offering. It, it you, was are a, first, you're, you are basically our first crypto-centric guest other than yeah. Biology. <laughs> so you're going to have to do a lot of editorializing sure. on yes, everything. Sure. <laughs> it, it was a way for people, it, think of it like crowdfunding uh, for, for people who got crypto rich. Uh, it was a mm-hmm. way for people to diversify their crypto assets um, without having to pay taxes on them. <laughs> That's sort of one way of positioning it. Um, and what happened was, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars were, um, maybe billions, I, I, a lot of money was raised to uh, and, and put into crypto projects before they even had, uh, it was just off a white paper. Hey, if Bitcoin is now worth a trillion dollars right. off a white paper, maybe these projects could be too. And so, as you can imagine, it attracted, you know, uh, both, you know, one percent of the diehards and 99 percent of the scammers <laughs> um and so a lot of people lost a lot of money a lot of projects you know didn't end up working out um and what i hope there to your example and carlotta perez ha- has some great stuff on, on the on just sort of this cycles of, of infrastructure is that what we get there is while there's a lot of failed projects it'll be a lot of infrastructure that has been that has been layered um such that you know five years from now ten years from now there's not just a boom on the currency side but uh, on the true decentralized internet, uh, on the browser level, on the uh, so for social media perspective, um, at just every layer of the stack. So, yeah, these uh, the, the, these things are these things are all connected, and it goes back to the uh, you know the saddest words in language being Balaji was right, <laughs> and uh, you know what, what Balaji is most influenced by is is the sovereign individual, uh, which is this sort of idea. Or it's, it's a book, um, and the main thesis is that. Um, the individual is going, because of technology, uh, people are gonna become a lot more mobile and people are gonna become uh, able to defend themselves a lot more and protect their their money, protect their identity. And what's going to happen as a result of that is that uh, governments are starting to, uh, politicians will compete over their um, over their citizens, treat them like customers in, instead of citizens. Um, and when you treat someone like a, a, a customer, you have to serve them. You have to offer a better product because you now have the threat of exit, right? We've had the threat of voice, i.e., voting, but exit um, has been hard. It's been it's hard to move, um, and it's it, it's hard to coordinate with people. And so the cost of coordination has gone down. And again, you know, a, a couple of years ago, Balaji was was talking about this. He was talking about moving to Austin. Everyone thought he he was crazy. I mean, people still think he's, he's crazy, and he is a little bit crazy. <laughs> um, but you see this right now with Miami, right? You see a, a mayor of Miami going on Twitter, his literal question was, how can I help? That That's how low the bar was to get uh, Keith Boy and a number of people uh, to move. Of course, you know, there are better tax uh, t- t- you know, tax incentives uh, in, in, in Miami. I'm sure that, I'm sure that helps a lot. But we're, we're starting, and, and we saw, you know, the, uh, I forget which politician, but someone in, in San Francisco say, you know, uh, an expletive, uh, you know, to Elon Musk, um, you know, get, get lost Elon Musk, and, and, he, and he went to Austin. So we're going to start to see people become a lot more mobile, be able to coordinate and, and governments start to start to compete. And so, yeah, as we think about being good investors and thinking about what startups are, are going to emerge, you have to think about it, of how, how it fits in with, with where trends are going. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Eric. It's a very interesting phenomenon. It's also, it's also been a light, like in terms of the Twitter discourse. I want to interrogate it, I think, from perspective of maybe some of our listeners who like they see what's going on with the mayor of Miami. And they're like, you have our mayor who's like 
outwardly soliciting like a bunch of like rich, you know, dudes who are online in order to bring to our city. And almost every time that this type of thing works out, you have politicians who make deals with these rich people and you give them tax breaks or you write some like fake thing into the tax code and you end up with Foxconn, like in Wisconsin, which is like a fake factory and was supposed to deliver these tens of thousands of jobs and GDP. And it turns out just a bunch of people got rich, state regulators and this Taiwanese company. What do you think prevents that from happening with the end state of the sovereign individual thesis? Because like when you say it, Sounds great. You're like, yeah, everybody has to compete against one another. In practice, what does it look like? Amazon HQ2 and everybody just throwing as much tax dollars on the floor as they possibly can with no real indication that it's going to like call, come crawling back. What do you think about that? I, I think both things can be true. I think um, net positive, um, it can be uh, you know better off for, for, for any city to get these people. I mean, I think, I don't know the exact stat, but I think it's something like, in, in California, or maybe it's just San Francisco, like 0.1% of the population is responsible for 40% of, of, of the tax dollars. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think both things can be true in the sense that, do I think these people are going to get enormous tax breaks and it's going to be a, a race to the bottom? Yes. Do I think that they will still contribute meaningfully to the to the, to the tax revenue um, and, and, and just talent coming and other sort of positive externalities? Um, also, yes. But I think broadly, I, I'm less excited or, or less a believer that there's going to be all these new hubs in in uh, you know that that emerge or the next Silicon Valley and more that just that everything goes remote uh, or, or or I should say a lot goes remote and and people live on the internet um, and it, it is a little bit a race to the bottom in the sense that uh, these these you know like um, they're going to compete over who can you know offer the best uh, you know tax haven and and other things but also they're going to be forced to run their um, you know, their, their organizations like businesses. So they're going to be forced to restructure, to be a lot more innovative, to be a lot more effective. Um, and, uh, and, and the best ones are going to be, are going to be super lean and, and provide their citizens better services uh, as a result. So I think there's reason to both be pessimistic and, and optimistic uh, yeah. as a result of that thesis. There's so much there, man. And I want to tie this back to the conversation we're going to have about higher education in a second. But can you talk about how you conceive of citizenship, because there is just going to be a bunch of people who are basically going to say, we're not customers of government, we're citizens of government, right? Like what, what differentiates government from a business is that a government is in the business. The job of a governor is not to manage a profit and loss statement. It isn't to give a direct return to shareholders. It's to take a society, take a community, and basically provide the best outcome for the most amount of people or some combination thereof. So how do we how do we balance that? Because my problem with what you're saying, because I understand the trend that's driving it is I'm concerned there could be a degree of inevitabilism in this space that could reflect the way our debate about globalization. So for example, Past 30, 40 years, you know, we all like, you know, we went, we went to school, we've, we're living on the internet recording this podcast online, we're really benefiting from this globalization phenomenon. Um, that system was really great for us. But a lot of people who are a bit older than us, so we don't have to take personal responsibility for this, but people who look like us, talk like us, come from the same background said, globalization is inevitable. We have to do NAFTA. We have to let China into the World Trade Organization. We have to do X, Y, and Z thing. And anyone who doesn't accept that reality just doesn't understand trends. They don't understand the free market, et cetera. Now, we can agree that the trend online is just there. Obviously, that's true. It's very hard to make the case. And I'm sure you're probably going to run into this with your portfolio companies. It will be harder for you to tell people, no, you have to live within 20 miles of me, given this dynamic. That's definitely true. But at the same time, there are a bunch of public policy choices that we could make that that there are a bunch of public cho policy choices we can make that if we assume this is inevitable, could end up really biting us in the ass. So for example, if we just think it's inevitable that this isn't going to happen, we couldn't have an honest conversation about exit taxes. So for example, if you, let's say like you, you're from New Jersey. So let's say you've been in New Jersey your entire life. You've paid, ta you, you know, you've, you've paid taxes, you know, all these different things. You were supported by public infrastructure. You were supported. I mean, you went to University of Michigan. Yeah. So to a certain degree, obviously you're paying out of state, but there was some degree of support from the state. 
How do we balance that, right? Because I think it's, I'm not a communist, I'm not a socialist. I don't think it's cool to say, Eric, you're moving, we're going to take all your money. But there is a dynamic there that if we don't have the conversation now, it is going to end in punitive. It is going to end in reactionary politics. So that's a lot there. But how do you just think about the overall dynamic? Well, there's sort of two um, things that I think it's worth separating out. One is people talk about the economic uh, effects of, 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 of what's happening when they talk about globalization and people being uh, left behind and how that leads to polarization. Well, I, and I think there are certainly trade-offs there. A, a lot of people get ahead, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, especially globally, uh, you know, and some people get left behind. I think it's, it, it's probably economically net positive, but we have to do something for the people who get left behind. I'm, I'm less sympathetic to that, that that is the cause of, 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 of all of our polarization problems, because I think uh, a lot of our polarization problems are actually uh, the elites arguing amongst each other. It's, it's people who go to Harvard and Yale. It's sort of the, the 1% versus the 0.01%. Um, what I'm more sympathetic to is this idea that um, Patrick Deneen's argument of, of why liberalism fails, which is basically that it becomes a, a victim of its own success, that if we all start to view each other as customers, um, you know, if, if effectively that means that we all view each other as sort of independent. We don't, you know, as a customer, you don't owe the business anything, right? And so um, I think we have to have a, a and, and so what that leads to is, um, you know, no more dependence on, on, on people and, and thus no loyalty. And thus, you know, we just increasingly become atomized and, and fragmented and, and individualized and, and, and don't, you know, sort of, and that ex, you know, explains a, a lot of our, you know, loneliness or anxiety or just lo loss of community. Um, so I think we do have to straddle this line of, of, of citizenship, of customer versus citizenship. Customer in the sense that, hey, um, you know, clean the poop off my street, right? Like that yeah. sense. Exactly. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make it a safe place. Yes, exactly. But citizenship in that, you know, we are part of a community and, and we should take care of each other. And, um, you know, there's this, I, I can't forget who, who has this distinction between sort of the somewheres and the anywheres. David yeah. Goodhart. David yeah. Goodhart. Yeah, I, 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 exactly. And so I, I, I think, I don't think economic, like I don't think exit taxes is, is, the, is the way to do it. I think, um, and I, I think that's only going to accelerate the, the sovereign in, individual. Like it's only, I, I think it's more, it's more um, hearts and minds. And I, I think the, the challenge with San Francisco is that San Francisco is in a tough place where, and California more broadly, where the people that are funding it, they're, uh, they're calling extractors and exploiters. You know, Zuckerberg, $75 million donation to a hospital. I think it's like the biggest one. And because he had his name on it, they call him extractor. So uh, you're not going to win hearts and minds by demonizing rich people and, 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 and thinking that we're in this sort of like, you know, conflict theory that, you know, when someone gets rich or a company gets rich, it's at my expense. And going back to crypto for a second, one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in, crypto has this idea of, of tokenization. Let me zoom out for a second. When, when, when the corporation was invented, it was the big innovation there was instead of uh, you know, one person owning or, or the entire company, you now had hundreds of employees who could have shared upside in, in the company's success. Um, and, and that's just transformational. So instead of one person getting rich, you have hundreds or thousands of people getting rich. What crypto wants to do is, is also give the users uh, upside in, in, in the company. And so when we think about like, you know, Facebook and Twitter, these are data products, right? If you go on there, you have a big following, you have helped make uh, add value to that to that product. You've added data to it, and you don't see any of the economic gains from it directly. Um, but but maybe you should, um, and not from a top down regulatory perspective, unless it's like you know, let people transfer a API keys. But more from uh, they should incentivize you to to want to contribute more, reward you from contributing to the network, and imagine how much um, more you know companies or people would have appreciation for for these companies if when they got rich, they got rich too. Uh, or they saw a shared upside in that. And we do have it a little bit, like right now it's too sort of indirect, like it goes to taxes, which then goes to their services, but they don't connect it to, hey, you know, Jeff Bezos, whoever, you know, uh, helped pay for this service that I use. That They're outside with a guillotine at Jeff Bezos' house thinking that, you know, he took money from them. So I, I would more like to tie it, whether it's tokens, and that's something that, that crypto is thinking, or if, if there is some version of UBI in the future that it's tied to the stock market, because we want to have a, a greater appreciation for how how wealth is created. We want to put people on the same side instead of thinking that there's this sort of um, you know zero sum uh, you know relationship. Yeah, I think aligning the incentives is the most important thing. And it's interesting, you know, you're talking about citizenship and customers. I mean, one of the areas where the customers, aka people, have been completely failed here, and where you're really focused on, is higher education. 
Um, and this is something you're working kind of directly to disrupt. I mean, let's talk here of just terms. I'm sure most of the people here who are listening to this podcast are not satisfied with the higher education system or with their own student debt um, or with their own, you know, having having gone through the system. Just lay it out on a macro level. What can actually be done about it from your perspective, a more like free market perspective? And what have been the structural problems as to actually doing anything up until now? Quick thing, before yeah, you answer those, can you just define the problem in higher yeah, education from your perspective? Because that's because that's where the debate comes in from the start. Mm-hmm. So can you define the problem and then get to Sagar? It's all you could just probably restate yeah, those. Yeah, yeah. There are multiple problems. The, the the ones I like to focus on is that it, it's too expensive, and it is just and the, and the expenses are rising. It it's it's um it doesn't prepare people effectively for the labor market, um and it um so it's not serving its uh, one of its value props, and it is uh too monopolistic, um and basically serves as a cartel that that affects uh, competitors for, from entering. So too too expensive, not helping people get jobs uh, sufficiently. And uh, it's 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 monopoly. Okay, so what caused those problems? What is the cause of those problems, and what's your solution, and what are other solutions? So basically, on the um, I'll start with the uh, the uh, get, getting jobs. Um, we have a problem where um, many basically what happened was credential inflation. Everyone thought that in order to um, get a great job, you had to go to college, but there weren't enough great jobs that required college degrees to serve everyone you know, go, going to college. 50% of employed college graduates got jobs that required a college degree. And only 37% take jobs that required even a high school uh, degree. Um, so it, just to paint, paint a visual, there were 100,000 people in 2010 who took a bachelor's degree who became janitors. There were over 5,000 with a master's degree who became janitors. Obviously you don't need to go to college to, to, to become a janitor. And so we've told people that college is this insurance that, that you need to do it in order to, to, to get a great job. And what happens is we're not having enough great jobs to, to overcome to overcome it. And, and because there's not enough interlocking between what people are learning and what the job market is, is, is requiring. And so we're starting to see the unbundling. I mean, if you think of college as a bundle, it's uh, education, it's network, um, and it's credential. We, we, we unbundled the education, you know, a decade ago with uh, with MOOCs, with with on, online courses. Um, but you still left the the network and, and, and the credential. Um, what, what we're starting to see is is uh, well, we'll get to COVID in a second. But is job specific uh, courses? Uh, my friend Scott Belsey calls this edupployment, which is combining the education and employment into one. So you're starting to see things like Lambda School, which help people learn how to code and then get them a job. This is rise of boot camps. And you're starting to see that for not just code, but uh, a bunch of other sectors. Learn how to do sales, learn how to do growth, learn how to do marketing, learn how to do skills that employers want. And I, I, I imagine pretty soon we're going to see uh, Facebook or Google or some of the Walmart start to have their own boot camps or their own, you build their own pipeline where, where people can say, hey, you know, if I can get into Harvard or Stanford, I'll go there. But if I'm going to some, you know, tier three university, um, I might as well just go to Walmart because I could just Walmart you. I could guarantee that I'll, I'll get a job. I can get the liberal arts on the side. So we're starting to see a great unbundling. But we're realizing is that the unbundling by itself didn't work. Like MOOCs didn't work because completion rates weren't high enough. Uh, mm-hmm. And you wanted to go to parties. You know, colleges bundle a bunch of other stuff too. It's, it's social life. It's coming of age. It's relationships. And so the winners are going to be people that that rebundle. Um, the, uh, the, the, the uses of college. And so we started, uh, on deck started on the career, uh, element. Um, but I could see us over time, uh, or, or pretty soon doing a liberal arts component or even a school of life component, um, so that we could start to just rebundle some of the things that people get in their college experience, do it for, and do it for a fraction uh, of the cost. I want to know how you solve a problem that comes up whenever people talk about credentialing. And I sort of call this, I call this the... HR problem in the sense that if you apply for any job, we could talk as much as we want about how 
college doesn't necessarily indicate education. There could be, you did some interesting writing about how as schools eliminate testing requirements for the SAT, there's a possibility that that could actually weaken the degree as a credential because there would just be no metrics that anyone could outsidely, that anyone could assert from the outside, et cetera, et cetera. All those ideas are important, they matter. But what always stops me is that if you look at a marketing firm in the middle of the country, somewhere totally random. At the end of the day, if I apply for a job and I have a degree from a university and there's a person who doesn't have a degree but has taken various MOOCs, has thought about problems in different ways, has a really great Twitter account, I am still probably going to get chosen under this scenario because the HR manager, who's a 30-something person who is busy, doesn't have time to think about the big debates, is always just going to choose the credential. So within that dynamic, how do we think about solving that bottleneck? Because that bottleneck doesn't exist at Google because there are various cultural reasons why that's just not there. And, you know, in tech, there's, it's certainly cool. Like, Naval had this great tweet where he said, the smartest thing you should do in tech is you should get into Stanford University and immediately uh -oh. drop out. So that <laughs> everyone knows you got into Stanford. So you're smart. You were a hard worker in high school, but you don't have to actually pay any money for it. Yeah. But that, that doesn't that, exist in the middle. It doesn't exist in the bottom. And it doesn't exist in most of corporate America. So how do you think about solving that basic HR credential? Because I know you've written a lot about peer-to-peer -peer credentials, different yeah. things like that. Well, th that was my tweet, actually. I said, I, I said Harvard. I Maybe Naval did it too. You know, me, Naval, yeah. same thing. <laughs> um, yeah. but the, um, no, no, I, I love that you brought up credentials because I mentioned the education has been unbundled. The network is starting to be unbundled. The credential is really the last thing that's just so hard to, to unbundle. And, it, and it's so powerful. And we, we saw this with COVID, right? Um, you know, when, when before COVID, you could sort of tell the story of all the, all the sort of bundle and things that were happening at, at college. And that's why it's worth, you know, quarter million dollars or, or, or more. But in the era of COVID where everyone had to sit home, there was no networking. It's literally Zoom University. And you're still, it's still the same price. You're still paying quarter million dollars for a piece of paper because you'd actually probably rather watch YouTube than, than what you're, you know, the best professor in the world than the one that you happen to have and, and their talks are free. And so that has sort of shown, hey, I'm really just paying for this piece of paper and, and the piece of paper is valuable. Like we have to bow, bow, bow down to it. Um, but what we started to see over the, over the past few years is just stabs at it. It's, it's, it's sort of like Craigslist. It, it, you know, the unbundling of Craigslist happened by death by a thousand cuts, by thousands of companies taking, you know, unbundling little, little elements of it. And we're starting to see it in, in credentials, you know, GitHub with, with coding, for example, um, uh, Behance with, with design. And, and it's not gonna be for every single one, but we're, we're starting to see, you know, unbundling for, for skill specific ones. And I think that's pretty powerful. But what I'm most excited about is is peer to peer uh, credentials because you know when people make hires today you know they'll they look at school but the biggest thing they they look at is is references if you get a bad reference from someone boom you're out if you get a great reference from someone who they trust you're in and um, you know there's this you know sort of trope that you know Silicon Valley only funds the the the, the Stanford kids but if if I were to ask you you know either of you you know which person under twenty five is going to be the next big thing in in, in, in tech or, or in media. I would much rather follow that, that person than uh, you know someone who tells me that they they went to Harvard or, or Stanford. And yet that information is not legible. It's not on the internet. It's it's not explicit. It, you know, I, I don't want to go through your you know the thousand people that you follow on Twitter to, to find. I want to say who who are the people that you really believe in. And so I have a vision. Uh, you want to see? I want to build it, or I want to see someone else build a peer to peer credential platform where people could say, Hey, this is my person. I sort of want to bet on mm -hmm. this per bet my reputation, but also maybe there's some social or actual physical currency, uh, like, you know, uh, speculation that you can do that. Um, uh, I don't need to get the logistics of how, how that could work mm -hmm. that that would incentivize you to, to identify really talented people early on. And this stuff's well with, with, with ISAs a little bit, because right now people are income are, share agreements, yeah, income share agreements. Yes. Thank you. Because people are, you know, paying this upfront, fee, you know, huge fee to go to college and then hoping they get a job afterwards. But you can imagine a crowdfunding, you know, for people who know what they want to do, you'd say, hey, instead of, um, like, why don't, can I just raise money for this right now? And it doesn't have to be venture capital. It could just be uh, an income share agreement where I, where I, you know, pursue this art project or pursue this podcast or pursue th this that talks to the creator economy. There's just so many more ways to make money on the internet. We need to make more ways to raise money uh, on the internet. 
and to signal value of, of who's really impressive uh, on the internet. So again, this is not gonna happen tomorrow. It's, it's not gonna happen next year. It's gonna be death by a thousand paper cuts, but over the next decade, you know, I think the the fine university, the best universities will be fine. The um, the you know, elite get into Harvard and you could pay yeah. for it. You should probably still go. No one's <laughs> saying don't do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you're thinking of doing art history in some um, you know, you know, tier three school, and you it's and you think you'll get an amazing job after that, you know, maybe just just talk to some people. If, you know, think think about it. Think about some other things you could do. If you do go to tier three school, maybe, maybe you know, learn how to code. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm very excited for, for, for credential to be, to be unbundled. So then the last question on this topic is, what do you think about the people who are getting screwed over by the current system? Because everything we're talking about, peer-to-peer credentials, great idea. As you said yourself, you're thinking about building this, you want someone to build it. So that's not coming into the table for a while. What do you think about something like student loan forgiveness? What do you think about the role that government plays in this? Because the example I always think of is, after the Great Recession, a bunch of states cut funding for higher education. So what that meant is in their states, if you were an in-state tuition attendee, which I did at the University of Oregon, you actually had to pay a lot more money. So as I think about this whole debate about the future and technology, I think, hey, at a baseline level, you probably could just restore higher education funding to what it was in 2007. I'm pretty sure in a lot of states post-COVID, you're going to see a lot of cuts to higher education further. So how do you think about the balance between people who are in the current system or have graduated and are screwed, especially if they didn't graduate, because that's the worst position to be in. It really sucks if you went to school, you didn't get a degree because no one cares about half degrees and you have all this debt. Or you're someone who's about to go to college next year and you're thinking peer to peer is great or Senator Eric could just like either make us my student loans or discharged in bankruptcy or we could raise the amount of money the state puts into a state university, even if it's a second or third tier, because we could dunk on the third tier state schools or third tier private. Actually, let's skip the third tier private universities, never go to them. But there's a world where a random, random, random third tier state school, if it's cheap enough, makes a lot of sense for you. So how do you think about that? I um, I don't know enough about student loan forgiveness. I don't know about student loan forgiveness because I, I think it's unfair to a lot of people who've, who've paid their, their student loans. And I, I don't know how to, how to reconcile, uh, you know, that and, and what, what to do there. I do know that we need to make sure that this doesn't happen for the next generation. And so mm-hmm. what, what government can do is sort of like, I don't mean to be glib, but sort of stop making it so difficult to innovate for us to lower the costs. You know, uh, healthcare, housing, and education are, are the industries that costs have been rising dramatically, where in many other sectors where government isn't uh, involved uh, or isn't sort of serving as blocker, costs have gone down. And so you're asking, why is this the case in, in education? Um, there isn't uh, innovation in education. You know, it, we were talking about Facebook and Apple and all these other companies being monopolies, but they get disrupted every 40 years kind of or- organically because uh, government sort of gets out the way. On the university level, you know, the last entrant into the top 10 or, or even top 50 maybe was, was, I believe it was Stanford and it was founded over 100 years ago. And so, um, and the reason why is because uh they choose who can be an actual university. There's an accreditation process, which has a good intent. I, we don't want to see Trump University or you know all these crazy, you know, crazy. <laughs> That's the most crazy, political statement we'll get from you yeah. the entire episode. <laughs> exactly. We don't, we don't see all, all these cr- crazy things. Um, but you're you you are making it so difficult uh, for well-meaning entrepreneurs who are very talented to to create competitors. Um, and, and what happens is regulatory capture. It's in their interest not to let competitors in so they can continue to, to rake in uh, the, the profits. And why disrupt yourself if no one else is gonna disrupt you? Um, and so the accreditation process is something that I think if that were changed, we would see a lot more uh, competition in, in education. And th- what we talked about when, you know, a monopoly doesn't care because it doesn't have to. When you have competition, people are, the, the, it filters out, the best ones rise to the top, and the customer gets the, the, the best experience. The students would have better experience. On the, uh, but that also happens in in healthcare and and, and housing. Um, in housing, we have a massive structural shortage, right? For in the last twenty years, we've seen uh, you know go, go down from eleven million units to, to seven million units. Uh, there's something like seventeen million people who can't afford housing. And in healthcare, nearly you know half of Americans have two thousand dollars in liquid assets. Yet deductibles are something like fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred dollars. So any healthcare issue means you're you're basically financially ruined. And what we were talking about earlier, when software ate the world, the, the best entrepreneurs often go to the place that has the least red tape. Um, now it's changing because we've already like 
co covered a lot of that. But if you make it easier to innovate in, in education, healthcare, and housing, you lower the, the costs while having better product. And then the next generation doesn't get into doesn't get into debt, um, or doesn't and it doesn't have to you know get wiped out by by, by these by these three. Um, I, again, this isn't happening anytime soon. There's there's no uh, no political will to, to to make it happen. So I, I think we need to uh, do it from a cultural perspective. We need to you know lessen the pressure to to to, to go to college if it's not, if it's not the right right thing for you. And we need to you know teach people to be more mindful with with, with their expenses and put more pressure on on, on governments to uh, to innovate on this stuff uh, uh, eventually. I, I know that's not a that's not a short term answer and that's not a you know one size fits all approach, but it's going to take a, it's going to take a number of things. Yeah, it definitely is. This is about as libertarian as I allow on the podcast. Eric, <laughs> just so you know, I want to make clear I'm not I'm not a libertarian. <laughs> uh, libertarians, uh, well, I'm sympathetic with with their ideas. They always lose. Uh, and there are stru structural reasons uh, why they lose. Live and let live is not an inspiring enough philosophy uh, as opposed to, you know, win and help win. Or if if your whole ideology is non-aggression and someone, you know, uh, uh, is aggressive towards you, you you're going to lose. I'm a, I am a believer, uh, furthermore, in, in state capacity and in Tyler's idea of, of, of state capacity. Tyler Cowan. Cowan. Yeah. yeah, and and what I would like to see is is the state working in conjunction with with the free market and and private enterprises to uh, to give the best solution because there certainly are externalities that the markets just don't don't take into account or market failures that they just don't have ways to solve for and so a, a symbiosis is is where I stand there. <laughs> uh, no, the last thing I want to get with you is media because obviously this is where we are at. A lot of the same dynamics also apply to what you're talking about. It's a pretty rigid industry. Um, it's rigidly in terms of how it functions on television, cable television and more highly regulated, large behemoth corporate monopolies. But then we also have this things like this, you know, tens of thousands of people are going to listen to this or, you know, whenever I do rising, like a lot of people will still watch that on the alternative and on the margins. There are things that are emerging, which tell us something is going on here. From your perspective, where do you see that going? Because I kind of have this, I'm of two minds, which is that of one mind, Ben Smith at the New York Times, he wrote this great profile of Cameo and more, where he was talking about how the future celebrity in America is not like a celebrity to everyone outside of people in the movie business. They're a celebrity to you. As in, most of the time, I walk down the street and nobody knows who I am. But like, Every once in a while, like once a week or so, somebody's like, oh my God, I love your show. And it's like, that's really interesting, right? So like to every maybe like one out of 2,000 people, you're someone who they really, really, really like what you do. Now, that's great from a subscription model and all that stuff. But in terms of wide culture and appeal, that actually has a lot of downstream effects. So how do you see the future of that industry, whether consolidation um, is even possible, and just like broadly, societally, what that means for all of us whenever it comes to media? Yeah. So so the, the broader trend here is basically that it's got the, the cost of creating media and of distributing media is, is lower than it's ever been and is basically going to z is zero eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that means is that you can find someone who speaks exactly to you like ex there's no sort of compromising exactly to you. Um, and that, you know, there's, there's riches in, in, in niches, uh, is, as the saying goes. And so there's, um, Kevin Kelly had this phrase, the old, the wired founder, he said a thousand true fans, yes. where if you have uh, a thousand people paying you a hundred dollars a month, you, you, you can make a living, uh, sorry, a, 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 a year, um, as, as a creator. Um, Lee Jin uh, has the idea of 100 true fans, where you could have a, a hundred people paying you a thousand dollars a year, and it really just goes to show that, as we were talking about earlier, the future is these private niche communities that can form, you know, that most customize to to to, to what you want. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, I think we're only going to continue to see that. I, I think we still need to increase the the ways by which these creators can can monetize. Um, and, and the ways by which they can, you know, raise money, um, um, and, not, and not just sort of have a cash relationship, but also have an equity relationship. Um, so I think we're going to continue to see the unbundling of, of creators, especially from media organizations that if they're creating undue value, right, they're going to say, Hey, I'm, I'm not paid enough by this organization. I'm going to unbundle. And, and I, and then after recreate some elements, if they're entrepreneurial of, of what this organization served to me, but what we're going to see basically is whoever uh, is it captures the value, uh, or sorry, whoever creates the value is going to find a way to capture 
the value. Whoever is responsible for user demand and user loyalty is going to find a way to better, you know, reorient the the value capture the the, the value chain such that uh, value creation and value capture are, are 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 more aligned. So that that's sort of where I think about in the business perspective, and I think it turns out people have wanted to hear from individuals more than they've wanted to hear from institutions. Yeah. Just decades ago, it was just harder for an individual to, uh, you know, one, get an audience, and then two, sort of recreate the functionality that the institution gave them. But this sort of goes back to the to the sovereign individual point where, where now it's easier and that will exist. So that, that's the business side. On the cultural side, I mean, as, as we mentioned, you know, people talk a lot about, you know, fake news. R really, it's, I mean, when we had three channels, it, it's not that everyone agreed uh, uh, all the time, but everyone had the same coordinates by which they could even have a disagreement. Yeah. Uh, now everyone is watching different is having different coordinates, so they can't even have a conversation. They can't even agree on what happened, uh, let alone agree on an interpretation of of what that means or where that's going. And I, I think that's only going to continue. Uh, people are going to shoot. What, what these content creators are are really reality entrepreneurs that are offering you the version of reality that you can opt into. And in, an era, in the COVID era, like no one knows who to trust anymore, what institutions to trust. Mm -hmm. People are desperate for for having a reality that 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 makes sense to them. So so I, I think it's only going to contribute. My my friend calls this kaleidoscope theory, which is uh, this idea that uh, culture fragments into thousands of shards. Each culture plays out its own fantasies alongside the other cultures. The result is a skyrocketing innovation at the cost of shared alignment on anything. And it's a trade-off that could make sense if it, as long as it doesn't lead to complete chaos. And then it sort of begs the question. TBD, hardcore yeah, TBD yeah. on the complete chaos yeah, point. Exactly. This week is going to tell me that kaleidoscope theory is bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the, um, you know, there's this uh, great quote somewhere. It was like, is all this stuff going to make us happy? And the, the person, all this innovation, and the person responds, no, 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 you'll be unhappy, but you'll be unhappy in new and creative ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it sort of begs the question, like, did we, what about sh shared reality, not just shared coordinates, what about shared reality, didn't we have it? And and it, it's unclear, you could answer, no, we had a shared myth where everyone is under the same delusions, but this goes back to the uh, Martin Gurry's sort of revolt of the, of, of the public. Um, in the information age, you can't keep up the delusions anymore. You can't control the narrative. There's all these competing narratives all of which have shards of truth to them. The, the more information there is, the more arguments over what's true. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't see uh, alignment uh, happening on, on broad scale ways, but I do see people finding their own private communities to speak to them and, and, and find meaning to them. And what really we need to figure out and help them find meaning is how to, how to make these interoperable. How to make them so they don't uh, cause conflict among each other, but find um, you know things, other common enemies. <laughs> Maybe you know the joke is an alien invasion or something. Um, other things that they can cohere around, even if they have different senses of uh, of reality. That that's our big challenge. No, and I love that you brought that up because the weakest area in the creator economy, because of the niche dynamic, is just the echo chamber. Had Eric Weinstein on the podcast last episode, it's not exactly easy to argue with Eric, so I will argue with him now, but he's not here. <laughs> he's talking about the alternate media of places like the IDW. The reason why it's not a true challenger to the mainstream media is it's just an echo chamber. It only speaks to itself. There's only so many times that you could bring the same set of people on the same podcast to bring the same conversations, the same topic. You only get so in-group. And in many ways, the dynamics of the creator economy with the whole idea of get your top five seven percent of people to pay get your top most intense listeners engaged that will not encourage you to balance the art of how do we speak to new audiences mm -hmm. how do we have our private community but how do we also to your point interoperate you know it's interesting it, it, when we only had three channels you know that that was a, obviously a big there was just one echo chamber and what happened is you now have a lot of these others and they they certainly don't talk to each other or as much as they should per your point on the idw but what's interesting i think the you know but there's a reason, like, I think Eric Weinstein would say, hey, I'd be willing to go on any other show. Yeah. I've just been iced out. Uh, and so there, there, this, sometimes people talk about the filter bubble problem as though it's, a, it, it's the worst thing that's possible. Although, what's, in my opinion, what's worse is just total ideological you know, uniformity. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've, I've learned to maybe celebrate the fact that there even exists different bubbles because they're, they're been necessarily used to. And, and you, you know, especially in this censorship world, you can imagine a world where, where they're snuffed out and everyone is forced to, mm -hmm. forced to think, it's, you know, like China doesn't have ideological, you know, uh, filter bubbles. <laughs> so nearing the end of this, what I have to ask is, 
you have done multiple podcasts in terms of hosting them. You're here. I'm really enjoying talking to you. We get constant comments from our listeners about how do I start a podcast? How do I start a newsletter? You also have an excellent Substack. This is also something you know you and I are thinking about and working on an Ondex. So we're asking this to basically every creator we bring on. How would you advise people think about building in this new media space, especially if they're new? Because my last bit on this here is that I'm incredibly frustrated by the fact that too often the people who succeed in these new creator economy spaces are people who are already big somewhere else. So for example, Stir did this, and Stir is also somewhat that comes from the on-deck space, but when they did this really cool pre-subscribe drop. So it said, who are people who people would pay money to if they left their existing institution? That's really exciting. There could be a world where you could see that leading to a lot of interesting new voices, but all it really meant is that the top four or five writers were at the New York Times. So there are people who've been blown up over 10 years. The New York Times is a massive audience. If the New York Times is seeking to compete for the top people, if Barstool is trying to get the caller daddy types to stay and not leave, what they will tell people is, we will get a billion people to see your face. Sagar and Jetty, I work at Big Media Corp want to be effing famous, I will make you effing famous. Yeah. You don't have to just have your 15 minutes. That's always going to be the bit that works there. So as you're answering this question, just think about what is the 20-year-old who, who, and you know who you are because you DM and uh, email us a lot, who is just a random college kid who isn't going to a no-name school, isn't going to a named school who wants to build, but isn't going to have the New York Times or Rising or the Realignment or On Deck to back them up when they start. I um, just as inspiration for that kid, uh, that 20 year old kid, check out this history uh, YouTube channel called What If All This Tea? We can put it put it in, in the show notes. It's just this sophomore at college who's built up this business on this, uh, you know, and you might drop out for it, teaching people how to how to do uh, or just teaching people history, just uh, explaining his passion to, to people. And he's not, you know, the best historian in the world, but he's super dynamic as a speaker and he can break down really complicated concepts. And so, and one thing I would tell that person is, Look for role models, look for examples of people who are doing what you want to do and see how you could bring, bring your, your, your own spin to it. Um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, we were talking about MOOCs earlier. The reason they didn't work, you know, people didn't complete their courses is because they didn't have accountability. And so what we're doing at OnDeck is combining the benefits of MOOCs, which is, you know, learn at your own time, you know, don't, you know, pay a hundredth of the, of the price, um, but combining also the benefits of, of college, which is, accountability, like you have to do this thing, um, or you will, you know, suffer public shame. <laughs> um, and you, you've set, it, set a goal to it. So we have we have our fellowships that that, that combine those elements. Uh, Marshall, you're helping us lead the, the podcast fellowship, we have, we have the writing fellowship. And what they serve is, is not just accountability, but, um, but constant feedback. And so I think in the same way that you go to a, a uh, you know, you either have a personal trainer, or you go to a boot camp to make sure you get your workout in for, for, for many people. Uh, join a program like that. If, if you want to get a newsletter off the ground, or if you want to get a podcast off the ground, you want to go from zero to one, or you want to go from one to 10, be, whether it's on deck or something else, be part of a community that you either make or you join of people who are going to push you explicitly, directly, but also indirectly, uh, just by their example. You know, I, I love going to boot camp, seeing people just like run faster than me on the treadmill or whatever it is, and I, I got to go faster. Um, so yeah, I, I would look at what examples exist out there for, for inspiration. Um, and then I would, uh, I would, I would join and be, be part of a, be part of a community. So last question, this is totally random. Seriously, everyone, I cannot recommend Eric's podcast enough. My favorite episode you did recently was about the past, present, and future of the MBA with the head of IMG Academy, which I we could have another period someday when you talk about your nascent MBA career. Cause I think that's I think that's I think that's really interesting and 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 just really compelling on the ambition side there. But you mentioned this idea of what would it look like if the NBA or other leagues were set up so that players actually owned equity in the teams, in the league, because that's an application of the idea that we're looking at the, the creator economy. Because the mm -hmm. key thing of the creator economy, what matters there is that value is moving from technology to brand down to the actual person. So soccer with Rising, it used to be 30 years ago, the value was first with the cable network, the actual distribution of the cable cross, uh, of the cable cords across the entire world, the satellites, that's a billion dollar business. 
Then, as that gets cheaper over time, it's all about the brand. It's the Hill versus Fox versus the Washington Examiner, et cetera. But now it's basically you. Now it's basically can Sager get people on Patreon or Supercast or any of these cool new programs? Can he sell out on Cameo? All those sort of things. So you applied that idea a tiny bit to the NBA. I want you just to expand on it for a second because A, it shows that you have a pretty expansive dynamic thought here, but it's also an illustration of the fact that as we're thinking about what skills can you develop as a podcaster, it's the ability to bring in different concepts and apply them to different areas you wouldn't have thought of it before. Right. So, and what Marshall's talking about is about my NBA career is that LeBron called me at, you know, about joining the Lakers. And I, I told him I'm too busy with on deck, but <laughs> maybe next year, uh, uh, no, I wanted to be, I wanted to be a coach at, at one point. Um, but this is really fascinating because if you take, you know, one thing from this podcast, as it relates to creators, it's this idea that whoever captures uh, user demand or customer demand is going to capture the value. And a lot of our industries, uh, you know, music, uh, books, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, others, um, there have been these middlemen that have taken too much of a cut and it didn't accurately reflect the, the, the value creation, right? We even see it in tech founders used to get really terrible terms from VCs. And, and now VCs are, you know, the, the joke, the meme among VCs is they always say, how can I help you? When, when is actually, it didn't used to be the case. It actually, VCs treated founders like shit, but founders, they, they, they get the customer, they could have customer demand. And so they are in charge. And now every year they're getting increasingly better valuations, just more and more leverage. And we see that uh, it hasn't fully happened in, in music yet, but it's going to happen. Uh, it doesn't happen because record labels own catalogs, and, but you know, more Just artists, ripped. right. More artists are going to be in control of their catalogs. Whoever controls customer value is, is going to, uh, is going to capture it. Uh, and so um, any, anytime there's the talent or the stars, they should be uh, over time. They will increasingly become owners, and so we see this in, in athletics too. You know, I mean, Michael Jordan. I mean, there was, you know, uh, he made way less money th than he should have made yeah. uh, based on you know how important he was. And so we see, you know, Mike Connolly getting you know 150 million dollar contract or whatever. The players are getting just more and more leverage, but they're using it uh, on on salary negotiations. What they're not using it, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know, is on ownership itself, um, is on equity in, in the business, and so. Um, I imagine you know, if LeBron James said, "Hey, I'm going to start a new league where the players own own a majority share of the equity," you know, that, this is sort of the thought experiment. And he, could he bring you know a few other players with him and now restructure the entire thing? Now, LeBron probably doesn't want to build a new NBA from scratch, right? What he would do, it, maybe that threat would would you know bring the NBA back to the table, and say, hey, "Okay, we'll give you anything um, if, if you stayed." And actually the most interesting business person here, this is a bit subculture, but is uh, LeVar Ball. Yeah. <laughs> is the uh, Ball Brothers uh, dad, because he is, he's doing it both on the league level, I think um, in sort of his, his minor league uh, experiment, which was very interesting, um, but he's also doing it on the um, shoes level, right? Because, you know, how much, who made more money uh, you know, uh, off of Jordan's, you know, uh, him or or Nike or, or, or whoever. Bill Knight, shoes? yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the shoe, whereas like Jordan should be making way more money. He, it's he, literally his, his, his he's, he's yeah. the silhouette. The, it, that's the I, most individual thing ever. Exactly. The, the co capacity to provide supply. And this is the great, this is the great realignment. This is what Ben Thompson at the Strecker blog talks about. Whereas controlling supply used to be the most important thing um, because distribution was, was limited. Um, and so what happened was with the internet, uh, distribution became unlimited. Now anybody could reach anybody, you know, at, at any time. And what what was the scarcity was now um, distribution. Who can control demand? Yes. And so that is realigned so many different industries, and they're still early in their realignment. But if you look at any industry and you look at who owns the the customer demand here, that person or that end group should have equity, should have ownership. Um, in the underlying asset, um, and so um, should share the majority of the profits that that come from it. And so, I, I, in the MBA and in other industries, we're still early on it, and it's going to be exciting to see. That's such such an important concept. That's literally where the world is trending. So I'm glad that we got to highlight here, Eric. Uh, thank you for joining us, man. This has been just amazing conversation. I think it's been very useful. I mean, for me in particular, I hope for everybody out there, just for somebody who's operating in the space and literally actively participating in those realignments to break that down here. So thank you for joining us, man. We really appreciate it. But thanks, thanks for having me. Love the show. Absolutely.